Okay, good. I'm recording this for quality assurance. And um, so uh, I'd love to see again, everybody on video. It's great to have everybody here. So a couple of things um, starting off as far as Champs Club, and this is like old school. Some of you have been on Champs Club your whole career and you're like, Phil, why are you talking about this? You're like lecturing the choir. You're telling us to you know, sing with all of our hearts. And we do that every single week and everyone ignores us. And that's how Patrick feels sometimes because he's in the choir. And, uh, but anyway, um, so I just want to talk about the purpose of Champs Club. You know, I, I, I was, it, so, it sounds so funny that like the division manager is thinking about this, but you know, some of you know, I like to work out and I like to do a lot of physical things. And so, you know, the more often you go to the gym, the more often you go mountain biking, the more often you play basketball, go snowboarding, and go scuba diving for that matter, uh, and all the things that I like to do, the, you, the better you get. Who's ever played a musical instrument? The tuba, the trombone, the piano. If you only play it once a week or once a month, you don't get very good. I have a guitar at home. I don't play that very often. Guess how good I am at the guitar? Not very good. You know what I mean? Uh, so the more often you do it, the better you get. And the more often you put your head in the game. How many of you guys are familiar with high school musical, right? The more you got to get your head in the game. And if you get your head in the game every day by going to Champs Club, you're only going to sell more Cutco. You'll never sell less Cutco. And again, when you check in, when you punch in at a job for four hours, eight hours, who's done that before? Raise your hand. Four hours, eight hours, right? Yeah, you're used to it. And how many of you have done that five days a week? Raise your hand if you've done four hours or five hours or eight hours or whatever shift five days a week. If everyone's done that before, I think you all understand you usually made more money. If you only did that twice a week, you didn't get very many hours. You didn't get paid very well. Does everyone also buy into that idea? So the cool part of it is that the entire thing, the whole, the whole Cutco job is kind of on your basis the flexibility, the freedom. You have the decision to make how much and how many and how many appointments and how often you're working and a little or a lot week to week, you can change that or week to week, you have the same schedule. But here's what I'll tell you. If you come to Champs Club three or four or five days a week, give me three fingers. You got to decide, are you a three-day-a-week person? Are you a four-day-a-week person? Are you a five-day-a-week person? You can decide. It is your decision. If you're in school coming up, raise your hand if you're going to be in school coming up or you are in school, right? Well, then you might be a Tuesday, Thursday only Champs Club. You might be a Monday, Wednesday, Friday Champs Club person because of your school schedule. You might be literally in the library or in the in the classroom. You're about to have a class in and you know the class starts at 930 and you're like, you know, I'm going to do Champs Club. And if you show up to work four or five days a week, don't you usually make more than if you don't show up to work at all? Yeah. Well, those jobs are four hours, eight hour shifts. This is a 90 minute shift, a 90 minute shift that could impact your income in the hundreds of dollars. Now, if you could work for 90 minutes and make hundreds of dollars, how many of you would put in 90 minutes of work? Raise your hand if you would do that, right? Well, when you do Champs Club, 90 minutes, not eight hours, not four hours. When you do Champs Club, 90 minutes a day, it's not 30 minutes. The workshop's 30 minutes, but the 90 minutes, right, guys? The 90 minutes is you showing up for yourself. And the sad part is, in the reality, and it is what it is, but the, the reality of the situation is that usually, it's so weird, but people will sometimes work harder for McDonald's, Walmart, Target, In-N-Out Burger, when they're told to show up for four, eight hours on a Sunday, on a Friday night, on the times they ask for it, on the times off, and the manager makes the person come in for work on the day they ask to come out to, to not be at work, right? And the sad part is, Chase, a lot of people will show up for McDonald's and in out burgers more than they'll show up for themselves. So this is not a lecture to anyone who's here, because you guys are here. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But for posterity's sake, right, this being recorded, I want to let you guys know that showing up 90 minutes a day, not six hours, not eight, not four, but showing up 90 minutes a day, 8 a.m. to 9.30, you're doing yourself the favor in the hundreds of dollars of income per week. How many of you guys can find 90 minutes worth a few hundred dollars? Everyone has already asked, has said yes to that. So I just want to remind you that Champs Club is for you and it's for you to do two things. One, learn, and two, earn, right? The workshop is the learning, but the earning is making the phone calls. So showing up at 8.30 is a little less good than showing up at 8, you know, 29. 
showing up at 8.30 is a little less good than showing up at 8.15. And showing up at 8.30 is a little less good than showing up at 7.59 and beating Phil to the Zoom. Sometimes I'm driving kids, so I don't get on Zoom right at 8 because I'm driving kids. But, um, you know, usually the kids are driving me crazy, but I drive the kids certain places in the morning. So, right. Uh, but anyway, I'll just remind you that, you know, you showing up for you from 8 to 9 is the best thing you can do for your income and for your success. Okay. Um, so there you go. 90 minutes, not four hours, not eight hours, but show up for yourself. All right. So now that we got a little, and remember, the, the earning is the phoning and the learning is the workshop. 8 to 9 30. Okay. So here we got it. I got, I'm going to give me two fingers. Give me two fingers. I'm going to give you guys two beliefs when it comes to selling Cutco. Two beliefs when it comes to selling Cutco. And this is something Staley knows. He just sold $24,000 worth of Cutco in his push period. And now your career sales, Staley, are you at 30, 35? What's your career sales again now, Staley? If you want to unmute. I think I'm about 38. $38,000. So you went from 14 to 38 in 17 days. And I can guarantee you guys, he had a really, really freaking special 17 days. You worked really, really hard. How many of those customers have gotten their cut code? Have you gotten the feedback? Have you gotten the phone calls? Like, I just got my knives. I got my knives. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of pictures. Like, oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I want to say this because Staley, before you, before you had sold, well, you'd sold the 14,000 before this push period, you went from 40 from 14 to 38,000 in a matter of 17 days, three weeks, but you know, 17 days of competition. And then we had the conference and everything. Um, how many, how many more people did you add to your list of people to call from people you know? How many did you add to your list from people you know that you didn't show in the first $14,000 in sales? Um, I definitely scratched the surface and I think I added, it wasn't too many, but I added like 10 to 12 new people. Okay. And how many did you have to start? Maybe that's the better question first of people you hadn't sold to yet. Did you have a hundred? Did you have 150? What did you, you know, prepare, you know, in other words, during the competition, you probably added 10, but before the competition started, you had already sold 14,000, but how many more people did you add before the competition started? Oh, I can't even remember. <laughs> okay. Was it 50, 100? What do you think it was? I think it was less than 50. Okay. So you added 50 and then you added 10. Is that safe to say? So you added 60 and you had already sold 14,000. Mm -hmm. I want you to raise your hand. If you sold less than 14,000 in your career, raise your hand if you've sold less than 14,000. Okay. That's probably the majority of people here because some of you are in your fast start, right? And you haven't finished your fast start yet. So you haven't sold 14,000 yet. So my point is this. Even at $14,000 in sales, um, Staley had already shown a ton of people that he knows, right? And he added 50 and then he added 10, 60 more people. And the reality of the situation, I was talking to somebody else this morning on PDI because they called in and I said, hey, if you sell $100,000 worth of Cutco, I bet in that $100,000, Nisa, and you've sold 30,000 almost or what, you're at 20,000 roughly, Nisa, or something like that. 22,000. And, you know, you're still showing and can show and keep thinking of people, you know, if you sell a hundred grand, you're probably going to sell maybe 50,000 to people, you know, and here's what happens six months into the job. You're still thinking of people you should show. You're still contacting. Oh, you're like, Oh, I haven't seen this person in 10 years. I just saw them. I could totally show them Cutco. How many guys have found yourself thinking, oh, I could show them, I could show them. Who's found yourself doing that? Everybody does that. My challenge to everybody here to have a bigger fast start, to have a bigger week, to have a better career, to get more referrals. Nod your head violently if you wanna get more referrals. Okay, you wanna get more referrals. Guys, people that know you and sort of know you, kind of know you, know your mom, know your dad, are familiar with your daughter, your son, you know, your daughter, uh, that, you know, they know you from your friends with her daughter, right? Or their son or their daughter, right? They are, they love show, letting you show them Cutco. They love seeing Cutco's from someone that they know remotely, like kind of know, not just know, like, you know, their social security number, right? But rather, you know them kind of, sort of. Those are the people that also give you truckloads of referrals. One, you're better at getting referrals. And two, you're more committed when you've sold tens of thousands of dollars worth of Cutco. So you're better at getting them. You're more committed. And they know a lot more people that you don't. They know a lot more people that you don't. 
That doesn't mean skip people that you know really, really, really well. But I'm going to tell you, the best thing you can do is keep adding to your list. That's number one priority. Even if you sold 10, 15, $14,000 daily, you still added 60 more people. And I bet you sold a lot of cutco and got a ton of recommendations from those people, right? Um, Staley, you made 8,000, 7,000, 6,000, and I think 6,500 bucks during the push in 17 days. How many guys would love to make $6,500 in 17 days? Right. Well, we got to get you those first four pay raises first. Staley was already at 30% when the competition started. So the sooner you get to 10 grand, whether it's in your fast start, your first 10 days, whether it's in your first 12 days, 18 days, 30 days, let's get you your first four pay raises. All right. Back to the two fingers. Let's talk about closing the sale and selling Cutco. I'm going to talk about two beliefs. So put these down in your notes. Okay. Two beliefs. Okay. First belief about selling Cutco. All right, the first belief that you have to know about Cutco is, is this, guys. The customer always uh, the customer always gets the better end of the deal. I started to ask Staley the question, hey, have they texted you? Have they shown you? Have they called you and said, oh, I'm so glad I got my Cutco, you know, and that type of thing, and they sent you pictures. The customer always gets the better end of the deal. Listen, even if you're Staley and you made $6,600, Staley, you saved like 3,000 of that almost for you know, the opportunity to run a branch office and to be, a, to be a leader in Cutco next summer, potentially, which is an awesome decision. Of course, that money is always yours. It could go to tuition. It could go to uh, you know, whatever you're going to do later in life, as well as Cutco opportunities and being a leader and a manager and things, because the company gives you money to run an office too. And you're going to Olean in a couple you know, weeks, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but my point is, um, that's $6,600. Correct me if I'm wrong, Staley. Do you owe anybody money like a college? Do you owe, like, are you gonna, are you gonna, or do you owe some money for tuition? Yeah, right. Uh, you might have a uh, future life. You might want to, you know, get married. You might want to buy a house. You might want to, you know, pay your cell phone bill, pay your insurance and buy yourself some food and some clothes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Does that make sense, Staley? So Staley, all $6,600 that Staley made, that money is spent or it's about to be. Can everyone nod your head? Your paycheck is like, it's going to be spent. You're not going to sit on top of your money, hey, as Staley, and count it. You're not Mr. Scrooge, are you? I don't think so, right? So the money is going to be spent sooner or later, right? But my point, and you might have kids someday, right? Very good, uh, gents. Um, and so, so there's that. But who gets to keep Cutco for the next 30, 50, 60 years, right? Every one of those customers that bought $24,000 worth of Cutco from Staley and now $38,000 from Staley, they get to use Cutco forever. So did you write down, customer always gets the better end of the deal? Because the money that they spent is going to be spent. It's going to be spent at Target, Costco. Guys, I'm literally making it rain right now. Do you guys know? They're going to spend it on mortgage payments. They're going to spend it on kids, on missions, on tuition, on groceries, on braces. I'm taking my kids to the dentist today. I'm getting a massage tomorrow. I'm buying. I'm paying the bills. It's called electricity. It's called insurance again. It's called groceries. It's called cell phone. It's called cable, internet, phone, mortgage, all the things, speeding tickets included. All right? So I'm going to spend my money. That's what money's for. But when customers get Cutco, they get to keep it forever. So thumbs up, two thumbs up. Who has two thumbs and believes Cutco's get the better end of the deal? Everyone has two thumbs, believes Cutco gets the better end of the deal. Okay, that's belief number one. Belief number two is that closing is something you do with and for a customer, with and for their benefit not to or on them. Oh, I closed the deal on this lady. Oh, I dropped down on this lady. Or I closed the deal at her, to her, whatever you want to call it. Do you guys understand? Closing is the process of finding the right value, price combination, where you're helping, hear this, you're helping the customer, right? You're helping the customer find the right value price combination where they get the right set of Cutco today, the right set of Cutco for them today on today's, today's budget, I guess we could say, right? 
That doesn't mean everyone's wealthy and you're just your job is to build value and everyone's going to buy an ultimate set. Guys, every customer you show could buy an ultimate set. If they had enough reasons and value and desire, they would throw down for 750 bucks a month. Guys, they buy four-wheelers, they buy uh, RVs, they buy boats, they buy trailers. Guys, I know a family that is struggling monetarily. Anyone know someone like that? Raise your hand if you feel like you know some customers that say or feel like or they talk like and they feel like they're struggling monetarily. You want to know the most frequent conversation I have with this family? This like the couple, they make money. Their their conversation, I had an hour long conversation with the other day. I was driving to and from, you know, down south, down southern Utah, and they're talking about buying a boat. They're buying a boat. But what do I hear out of their mouth? Oh, the finances were struck, you know, and they're actually talking about buying a boat. They're not dumb. They know they if they know they can or can't afford it. They wouldn't be talking about buying a boat if they couldn't afford it. Do you guys hear that? They wouldn't be talking. Now they could dream about buying a boat, but they're talking about buying a boat. And and they talk about their how they're struggling financially, yet they're still able to even fathom buying a boat, which is an un require it's an unnecessary purchase for most humans because everyone understands unless they live in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or something they don't need to buy a boat right so um so they can afford it and yet they talk about finances right does everyone understand that so it's natural for someone to feel like they're budgeting and things like that right and so I just want to make it clear um for uh perspective guys that the customers can definitely afford for time's sake I'm gonna keep the uh, distractions to a, a, le a lesser number here, guys. Um, and I want to make sure you guys understand if they're talking about it, that means they can afford something like that. Let me ask you a question. If they can afford or even think to afford to buy a boat, who thinks nod your head violently they could afford some Cutco that they'll buy once, use every day? You know how many times they use a boat? Probably three, four, five times a summer. And I'm talking if they really go a lot, it's twice a month. And it was, that was part of the conversation. Like, man, if you buy a boat, you got to like really plan on when you're going to go and when you're going to leave and when you're going to gas up the boat and when you're going to get everyone together and make sure you can get to Deer Creek or get to whatever place, or if you're going to drive an hour and a half to Pine View, or you're going to drive four hours to get to Southern Utah or five or six hours to get to Lake Powell, you got to really plan out these trips. That's a lot harder than using something every single day for the whole, the rest of their lives. And it's a gazillion percentage of what a boat costs. Okay, so closing the sale is the process of finding the right value price combination where they spend a gazillionth of a percent less than they spend on things they talk about buying. Do you get and they use them all the time. So dropping down is the next thing I'll talk about, guys. Dropping down is a service. Right? Dropping down is a service. Okay? And Dropping down is a service to find the right value price combination. So the next set, the next com comment I'm going to make is that the next set, the next set, whether it's the whether it's the homemaker after you show the ultimate set, if you know the three set close, uh, nod your head if you know the three set close. The three set close is money. The three set close is going to be taught in the next two days, either Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I think it's Wednesday. But the three set close is an awesome starting where you start with the ultimate, the signature, and the, or excuse me, the complete set, the family set, and the basic set, complete, ultimate, family, signature, basic, homemaker. You start with all three sets and you expose them to all of them and say, which do you like better? But then the next set in the, in the notes, you could write this down. The philosophy we all want to have, whether Drew, it's going from the ultimate to the homemaker or the signature to the homemaker or the homemaker to the galley, or the galley to the starters is that the next set is the perfect solution, right? This would fit your budget better is kind of the idea. I think I know this will fit your budget. You're going to love this. These are some buzz phrases, right? You're going to love this one. Patrick, are we good on uh, calls and texts? All right. So you're going to love this one. This will fit your budget better. Uh, we can still give you free stuff. We can still hook you up with free stuff. Guys, that is a huge thing. When you're dropping down, don't be disappointed dropping down. That right there is a note too. 
Don't be disappointed or surprised or sad. Tony Robbins says, your biggest problem, Kirsten, your biggest problem, Patrick, is you think you shouldn't have problems. In other words, being disappointed with any result from one asking for the order on the homemaker signature ultimate, and they don't say yes. If you're disappointed in that, that's a problem in your head. Do you guys understand? Like, don't be disappointed. Be expecting that they might say no. Now, by the way, let me go back to one of the most important things. You should ask for the order in two ways. In two ways. Same, same, same question. But one thing you should exhibit is confidence that, that they should buy it. They should buy it. Or um, the other way to think about it is um, you believe it'd be a very smart purchase for them. That's the philosophy first and foremost. When you ask for the order on the homemaker, let's assume in your mind, Abby, and you've sold near 10,000, if not more, we're the Cutco, right? Abby, you should be thinking you'd be silly not to buy this. And that's the way you ask for the order, Chase. You'd be silly not to buy this, Logan. In your mind, the, the, the music, remember, 93% of what we're communicating is not our words. 93% of what we're communicating is not our words. It's our tone of voice. It's our body language. If we're on an, a Zoom, a FaceTime, or an in-person demo, they should sense from your body language that you believe, what's up, Emma? Good to see you. That it's a smart purchase for them. You believe it's a smart purchase for them. That's the first thing about asking for the order. The second thing you ask for the order um, is like you're asking for the time. Hey, what time is it? Hey, would you like to get that? Literally that easy. Would you like fries with that? Would you like to biggie size your, your extra value meal? Would you like a shake with that? Right? Um. Or would you like some fries with that shake? Is, is that is that the thing they ask? Is that kind of old? I don't know. Okay. Um, but asking for the order like you're asking for the time. If you're nervous to ask, then that's on you. It, you know what? Let me put it in the customer's perspective. If you were to do the demo to me, and I'm the customer, I live in a home, I have kids, and you were to ask me for the order, and it was this straight, strange, nervous process, and you're at, like... Or for you to not even ask. I've heard of a rep showing the galley and not even asking the customer to buy it. They just show it because they're like, well, Jesse said drop down. Uh, Phil and Bucky and Sh and Patrick said drop down or whatever. I'm going to show it, but I'm too nervous to ask. You know what I mean? the weirdest thing is on the customer side of that, Emma? For me to sit through a presentation where someone shows me a brand new set of cut code that's not the homemaker. I said the homemaker is too much. They show me another set. And then they don't even give me the chance to buy it. That would seem like a total waste of time. Why did you even show me? And they may not even be able to conceptualize that question. They just were like, uh, okay, that was weird. Versus, would you like to get that set today? I think it fit your budget better, blah, blah, blah. You know, those questions really matter. Okay. So when you ask those questions of your customers um, and you ask for the order with intention, just realize they absolutely want to feel and hear and they want this. It's not just like a maybe. They literally want this, guys. They want to know that you think it's a smart purchase for them. They want to know that you think it's a smart purchase for them. And here's two questions I'm throwing in the chat box. These two questions totally set up the galley set. The next set is the best set. The next set is a perfect solution. And Aislinn, when you ask, Mr. Jones, do you carve a turkey every day? Do you guys understand? Nobody does. Unless they're literally working in a, in a, in a, in a restaurant and they're a chef. They don't carve a turkey every day. Not even the people that cook a ton cook a turkey every day. I, it may be 700 days since we cooked a turkey. I have no idea. Okay, even on Thanksgiving, sometimes people don't have turkey, right? So, but, but our roast, right? And then do you cut heavy duty stuff? Those two questions are staples. Whenever you're going from the homie to the galley, if you ask those two questions, what you do is you make the galley the answer. The galley is the answer. Now, who's ever been conflicted when you say, oh, but the next set is the starter, the starter set, and that set's perfect for them. Staley, I'm going to ask you or anyone that's sold over 10 grand, 
who actually feels weird when you're like, oh, but the starter set is the next set. It's the best set for them. When you just in your own mind were like, no, the galley set's the best set. How many of you guys can like, you're frustrated by like, you have like a weird feeling. Like I just told them the galley set's better and the starter set's better, huh? Well, here's why. On that budget today, right? The starter set is the best set based on the every day, week in, week out uses or needs. Okay. So the when it comes to the starter sets, Ms. Jones, this is for sure your best value, it seems like from you know today, from what you're telling me. If you haven't written that one down before, from what you're telling me, from what you're telling me is a, is a perfect phrase to go through dropping down. From what you're telling me, you could live without the bread knife. Guys, let's be honest. Who actually cuts bread every day? Every bread, every loaf of bread comes sliced unless they're making their own bread, which I love homemade sourdough bread. Who doesn't love homemade sourdough bread? Everybody loves homemade sourdough bread, right? But guys, most of your customers maybe aren't making their own homemade bread every day, so they don't even need a bread knife every day. Now, everyone wants a bread knife. That's one of the most popular pieces sold, right? Everyone knows that. But if they if they can live without that bread knife, maybe they can live without the turning fork. Maybe they can live without one piece of the galley set. Now we're talking about the starter set is the best use or the best value if they don't get the galley set. Now, long-term and ultimate sets the better value. Everyone knows that, right? But guys... Um, when you're dropping down, you should build up. Let's put that down. When you're dropping down, as you drop down, build up. Kirsten, I'm going to have you type that in the chat box here. I'm going to make you co-host. As you drop down, you should always build up the next set. As you drop down, build up the next set. And when it comes to the starter sets, you can't build up eight. So this tip on the starter sets is to steer them away from some of the starter sets. If they're jonesing on a chef's knife, don't sell them a kitchenette set. You shouldn't tell them the studio set's good for them. That eliminates, I don't know, three of the eight starter sets we have. If they love chopping salad, soup, stew, stir fry, stuffing, salsa, nod your head right now if you know people that use salad or cut, chop, salad, soup, stir, stir fry, stuffing, salsa. Well, then you should steer them away from the studio set and steer them away from the kitchenette set because they need a chopping knife. And if you know they love the spatula, Nod your head if you know people that love the spatula. Well, now you take them off the other sets because the essential set and the all knife set are the two sets that have a chopper and a spatula. So you steer them to the set. By the way, I don't care which starter set I sell and you shouldn't care which starter set you sell. And they only want to buy the starter set that makes sense for them. And they're all about the right, the same price. They're all about the same price. So does everyone understand what I mean by you don't care what starter set you sell? You don't, it's not like you're trying to sell one or the other because it makes you $4 more. You're selling them the right value. So you steer them towards the set that works best for them. They chop and they make sandwiches. It's probably an all knife set if they like trades. It's probably an essential set if they like a uh, 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 block, right? But if they don't chop and they want something else, it might be a studio set instead of the essential set. So when you're familiar with all the starter sets, you're hooking customers up. I'm going to finish in two minutes, guys. Um, so the last thing I want to say about dropping down is that uh, run, understand that there are the, the knee-jerk reactions, okay, that are in your text or in your, in your script, right? Dropping down, always respond with those knee-jerk responses. What those do is they allow them time to think. Okay, it doesn't mean you're going to sell the galley just because you read the manual. Just because you say what's it, it's not like some magic pill, you know, Jedi, and your name is Obi-Wan Kenivi, you know, and you did a, a, a special sentence in the manual, and you're going to make them buy a galley or make them buy a starter set. What those knee jerk reactions do, guys, is they give you the ability to let them simmer, let them think, let them contemplate. And when you let them contemplate the next set, the next option, the next thing, the next thing, you get you give yourself more time and you're setting up the galley. And then you're because you do such a good job on the galley and they almost buy a galley, then they're like, you know what? Let's get starter sets. And to wrap up, let me say this. The best reps, the best reps in our company sell a little bit of everything. 
Case in point, Staley, did you sell one, two, or three, or seven, or zero ultimate sets during the push? You sold zero. Did you sell one, two, three, or zero signature sets? Um, some are upgrades. Okay, but... did you sell one, two, or three signature sets? One. One. And did you sell one, two, three, or five upgrades to a signature or an ultimate? Three. Three. So essentially, you sold one and upgraded to four signatures. How many homemakers did you sell during the push? Three, three or four. Three homemakers sold, straight up sold. And any upgrades to homemakers? I don't, maybe one. Okay, one maybe. And then did you sell a galley or six? I sold a galley. Sold one galley and any upgrades to a galley? Probably mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually people upgrade to a homemaker or bigger. You know that. I know that. You should all know that. And then we're almost done here. Uh, how many starter sets did you sell out of the eight that we sell below the galley? I didn't sell any starter sets. So no starter sets, but a lot of your customers did own Cutco. I know that. And you know that. So how many three to five to six hundred dollar orders did you sell? I mean, roughly. Oh, I don't know. I feel like most of them would probably so five, be ten or fifteen. <laughs> um. I would say, I would say near 10. Yeah, right. You had 24 order. No, yeah, 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 like 24 orders for 24 grand. Is that about what it was? I think so. Something around the 20, mid 20s or something like that for 24 grand. And you did have one huge order at the end. But, you know, the point is how many orders under 300 did you sell, by the way? Probably about 10 as well. And, uh, yeah, so you had, you know, in the almost 10 and the almost 10 on orders that weren't homemakers or higher. So 20 of your 24 orders, if you will, right. Were orders that were not homemakers or higher. They were homemade, you know, galleys or lower. Right. And if it wasn't a set, it was a CPO, the size of a galley or the CPO, the size of a starter set or the mm -hmm. CPO size of a, you know, whatever. And so I hope you guys understand the best reps sell a little bit of everything. And you know why? Lean in and, and look in and ask me, guys, the reason why is that they're actually in it to help the customer. They're not worried about themselves. They're not stressing about money. They're not worried about being pushy. They're not worried about themselves. They're actually in it to help the customer. That's the process of closing the sale, guys. So, hey, great job, everybody, for being here today. I'm going to stop.